I'm Tom Morello, and you're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host, David Feldman. Hello, David. Good morning. And our producer, Hannah Feldman. Hello. And, of course, the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello. We're dealing with some very heavy material, but we can't escape it. We have to face reality. That's right, Ralph. On the program today, we welcome back Craig Mokhyber. As you may recall, Mr. Mokhyber served for more than three decades at the United Nations and left the UN last year in protest of what he considered that institution's human rights failures in the Middle East, and he warned of the unfolding genocide in Gaza. Remarkably, that genocide continues apace despite the reports of all the horrors on the ground. The International Criminal Court has issued arrest warrants for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and former Defense Minister Yov Galant for war crimes committed in Gaza. They are now officially international fugitives. We're going to talk to Craig Mokhyber about what those ICC arrest warrants mean, what to expect from the incoming Trump administration vis-a-vis U.S.-Israel policy, and also about how the current policies could result in blowback against the United States. Then to conclude the program, Ralph has some salient points to make about what he considers Trump's best cabinet appointment, the cost of rising credit card fees on small businesses, and a letter he wrote to AARP urging it to reform its practices because its nonprofit mission is coming into conflict with its business interests. As always, somewhere in the middle, we'll check in with our relentless corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. But first, the world just got a whole lot smaller for Benjamin Netanyahu. David? Craig Mokhyber is an international human rights lawyer and activist and a former senior United Nations human rights official. A human rights activist in the 1980s, he would go on to serve for more than three decades at the United Nations with postings in Switzerland, Palestine, Afghanistan, and the UN headquarters in New York City. In October of 2023, he left the United Nations, penning a widely read letter criticizing the UN's human rights failures in the Middle East, warning of unfolding genocide in Gaza, and calling for a new approach to Palestine and Israel based on international law, human rights, and equality. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Craig Mokhyber. Thank you. Good to be back. Craig, welcome back. Let's start with something that just never ceases to astonish and dismay me, and that is the vast undercount of the fatality toll in Gaza. Can you give me your view on this undercount? Because first, the Palestinians aren't given a right to live in freedom and justice. Now they don't even have the right to have their fatalities counted. And if the real count was published in the New York Times and on television and from the Biden administration, it would change the dynamics. It would force more pressure on Netanyahu to let Western reporters and Israeli reporters to go into Gaza, from which now they are been prohibited, except on guided tours. Can you give us your views on this undercount? The UN thinks it's an undercount. The only question is how much? Yeah, and, and let me say that your comment on uh, changing the dynamic in the sharing of this kind of information is extremely important. And I hope we'll have some time during this discussion to talk a little bit about the media and information pillar of the genocide that is unfolding in Palestine. But you're absolutely right. There is little doubt in my mind now that we are talking about hundreds of thousands of deaths in the Gaza Strip since the beginning of this genocide, this wave of genocide 14 months ago or so. We know there there are some things that we know. We know that already just from confirmed kills where bodies have been recovered, that 1,400 families have been entirely eradicated in Gaza during this wave of genocide. And you will know that Palestinian families are large families traditionally, And they have been completely wiped out, at least 1,400 of them, all of the generations, and erased from the public register, the civil register. There are more than 3,400 confirmed families that have only one survivor left. And And you're talking extended families, aren't you? Extended families. We're talking about being erased from the public register, the end of an extended family. 
this is what genocide looks like. And we know that the statistics that have been generated by the health ministry are confirmed kills in violent death by the Israelis, bombs and bullets and so on. And we also know that in genocide, particularly one that has been as systematically orchestrated as this one, that the majority of deaths inevitably come from designed starvation, disease, injuries, and so on. So the number of 45,000 or so that have been specifically identified as you know being pulled from the rubble and not having survived, that doesn't include the many thousands that are still buried under the rubble, a conservative estimate of which is 10,000. I suspect that is much more. There are those who have been totally obliterated for whom there are no remains remaining because of the nature of the weaponry being used in these densely populated civilian areas. There are those who are dying of disease, of thirst, of starvation. There are those who are dying by succumbing to the wounds that they have suffered. It has now been reported by the United Nations that every Palestinian in Gaza, every Palestinian in Gaza is either wounded or sick or both. And remember that even the statistics that were used in the Lancet study, they were using models that deal with deaths in conflict. They're not models that were originally designed to look at genocide where the killing is intentional. And in this case, you're not just talking about incidental starvation, incidental disease. You're talking about systematically and intentionally imposed disease and starvation, as we know from the comments of the Israeli leaders. And this is also a situation in which a key strategy of the genocide has been the systematic destruction of the healthcare system so that those who do become sick, those who do become wounded, are less likely to survive. Hospitals have been specifically targeted in this genocide in ways that the UN has never seen in the history of the organization, one after another. The identification and targeting of healthcare professionals has been a key feature of this. And those hospitals and healthcare facilities are not only targeted because they are places where people can get medical care and an opportunity to recover, from the attacks to which they have been subjected, but they are also places of refuge. And so for the Israelis, they represent a key obstacle to genocide that has to be systematically removed. And that's what they've been doing since the very beginning. And then the last thing I'll say on this, Ralph, that Gaza is now the world capital of child amputations. And that doesn't even cover the true horror because Israel blocks any anesthesia from entering Gaza as a means of imposing further agony on the population that they are subjecting to genocide, which means those amputations are being carried out on children and adults without anesthesia and often without sterile equipment or adequate hospitals such that even if they survive the excruciating agony of an amputation without anesthesia, they may well not survive the side effects. They may well not survive the infection. So the question is this, that in order to try to get away with this, the Netanyahu genocidal regime is going after the United Nations. They're bombing UN facilities, feeding facilities, educational facilities, health facilities in Gaza. They've killed over 200 UN staff. In Lebanon, they have artilleried some installations of the UN peacekeeping force that's been there for many decades. And in front of the UN in New York City, they attack the UN with the most foul Trumpian type knowledge when they are speaking at the General Assembly. So here they are, they're destroying UN facilities, they're killing UN staff. Why should they be allowed to stay in the UN? Why aren't they expelled from the UN? Well, you know, first of all, I should say, Ralph, that the irony is that in November, the UN announced that Israel had paid its dues in full in order to preserve its membership and to continue to fund the UN. So an organization that the Israelis say is a terrorist, anti-Semitic organization dedicated to its destruction is an organization that they have decided to be a member of and to fund. So, you know, when you look at the kind of propaganda that they distribute, which is very dangerous, by the way, putting a target on the back of the United Nations, you can see how ironic and how outrageous it really is. I've said that it would be hard to imagine any country in the history of the organization more deserving as a minimum of suspension from the UN General Assembly. No country in history has violated the principles of the UN Charter more than Israel, and it has done so from the moment of its admission in 1948. First, 
carving out the state through genocide, ethnic cleansing, and violation of the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration, the Genocide Convention, and then violating Security Council and General Assembly resolutions, Palestinian self-determination ever since. It has literally now achieved the world record again for the violation of UN conventions, UN resolutions of the Security Council, the General Assembly, the Human Rights Council, and for repeatedly defying all applicable rulings of the International Court of Justice, which is also a UN organ, that just their defiance of so many Security Council resolutions, that constitutes a violation of Article 25 of the Charter. And today, you add to that that Israel is on trial in the World Court for Genocide. Its leaders are the subject of arrest warrants for crimes against humanity in the International Criminal Court. The ICJ has found that it is perpetrating apartheid and that its occupation of Palestine is unlawful. It's attacking the occupied people of Palestine, but also many UN member states, among them Lebanon and Syria and Yemen and Iran. It has conducted transnational terror attacks in Lebanon and repeatedly carried out foreign assassinations. And it's been you know, repeatedly found responsible for gross and systematic violations of human rights by successive UN commissions of inquiry and special procedures. But what is most exceptional is that no country in the history of the organization has attacked the UN more than Israel has. It has openly violated the privileges and immunities of the UN. From the very beginning, it has repeatedly blocked UN investigations, UN personnel, UN agencies from entering. It has attacked and smeared and obstructed UNRWA. It even PNG'd the UN Secretary General. It announced that he was persona non grata. It's killed more UN staff than any party in history, more than 230 in the last year alone. It has detained and tortured countless UN staff as well. And it has regularly attacked and slandered and obstructed the UN and its duly mandated operations. As you said, it has repeatedly targeted UN peacekeepers, not just these recent attacks on UN peacekeepers in Lebanon, going back for many, many years. And it has invaded and attacked and pillaged and damaged and destroyed UN premises, bombed UN schools and clinics and warehouses. You could not imagine a situation in which a country was more deserving of being removed. And yet, there it is, still a member of the UN General Assembly. A lot of this behavior by Israel is protected by the United States veto on the UN Security Council and the diplomatic and political cover the U.S. gives to Israel among U.S. allies. So what do you see coming? Do you see any difference between the B.B. Biden and B.B. Blinken obeisance to Netanyahu? Do you see any difference coming in? How would you characterize the transition on Middle East policy from B.B. Biden to B.B. Donald? Well, Bibi is the key factor there. I mean, at their core, Biden and Trump and all of their predecessors since the 1940s have been equally beholden to the Israel lobby, to the broader Zionist project for the colonization of Palestine, and for the Israeli and U.S. domination of the Middle East. So at their core, they are the same. You can see proof of that in the fact that all of the mad policies of Donald Trump during his first term in the Middle East, you know, the Jerusalem embassy, the an illegal annexation of the Syrian Golan, the eviction of the Palestinian ambassador, the unilateral abrogation of the Iran nuclear deal, the nonsense, you know, Abraham Accords. Biden reversed none of these policies, and he tried actually to further advance them. And then he actually went further than Donald Trump by joining Israel in the perpetration of a genocide in Palestine. Now, of course, Trump is now putting together an Israel first administration comprised of some of the worst characters that we can find in the darkest corners of the United States. We're talking about fascists and white nationalists and Zionists and neocons and Islamophobes and xenophobes of every stripe. So we can certainly expect a dangerous four years under Trump. There's no denying it. Dangerous for the people of the Middle East, also dangerous for American citizens who are opposing the genocide and U.S. policy in the Middle East as well. You can expect all the violations of the human rights of defenders, human rights defenders in this country, starting with those defending Palestinian human rights. But, you know, we shouldn't forget that we've just had a four-year term under Biden and Harris in which they undid none of those policies and which they actually supported horrific international crimes being perpetrated by Israel. And Biden and his administration were at the helm of the brutal repression of human rights defenders here in the United States on college campuses and workplaces and the streets and in media places. So. We're going to go from genocide abroad and repression at home under Biden to more genocide abroad and repression at home under Trump. The only difference is that Trump won't waste his time on the kind of mendacious pretense of civility 
and humanitarian concern that was peddled by Biden and Harris as it murdered babies in their thousands. And we also know that Trump, he has to pay back uh, his policy, the $100 million check that he got from Marion Adelson. And that could well lead to his recognition of the illegal annexation of the West Bank or other unlawful moves like that. That will not change any realities or dynamics on the ground. The U.S. cannot impose itself on international law. That will still be an unlawful act. But in the end, we're not going to see a very significant change under Trump, just a ruder tone in the implementation of unlawful policy. Well, let's talk about the dissent bubbling up inside Israel here. As all Israelis know, Netanyahu is clinging to his job as long as the war continues in Gaza. So if you put aside the October 7th assault by Hamas, Netanyahu is despised by three out of four Israelis. But he's holding off and staying in office. Now comes the report in the New York Times that former Israeli defense minister Moshe Yalon is saying that Israelis Netanyahu regime, quote, is perpetrating war crimes, end quote, in Palestine. What do you think the significance of that is going to be? Are they going to try to quarantine him, prosecute him? Or is he speaking for what he says he's receiving? That is messages from Israeli soldiers in Gaza who are ordered to commit these war crimes, worried that there'll be defendants in the expansion of the war crime investigation by the International Criminal Court. Well, of course, I mean, what he said was that Israel is committing war crimes and ethnic cleansing in the north of Gaza and that it intends to resettle the land with new illegal Israeli settlements, which is not a surprise to anyone who's been monitoring the situation on the ground. But it is remarkable for a former senior Israeli official to actually make that confession public in the way that he has. It's been obvious from the start that the objective was ethnic cleansing and genocide in Gaza, that its objective has always been to kill as many people as possible, to render Gaza unlivable, so that any genocide survivors will be compelled to either leave or to die slow, agonizing deaths. So that part of it is not surprising. What's surprising is that it came from I alone, because you know you talk about the opposition to Netanyahu. The opposition to Netanyahu is about his governance. It's about his corruption. It's about his interference with the judiciary. It's about his failures on October 7th. It's about his failures with regard to the hostages. There is very little opposition within the Israeli public for the genocide that's being perpetrated. Sadly, it is broadly supported within the Israeli public. And you know that's not surprising given the history of the country and the kind of propaganda that saturates Israeli society. But it is also a product of one of the key pillars of this genocide, which is the media and information pillar, the media and information strategy that Israel has been practicing inside Israel, but also in the West in particular, because you know they realize that this genocide could not be sustained without the continuing flow of Western support of Western weapons and Western diplomatic cover and so on. And so that's been an absolute key pillar. And it's not just in Israel. The U.S. government and corporate media are also playing a key role in controlling the narrative by disseminating Israeli genocide propaganda, by covering up events that are happening on the ground. Israel is doing this also through the murder of Palestinian journalists. They specifically have followed, targeted, and killed journalists. It's another Israeli world record for the killing of journalists and media workers. More than 190 in the past year alone targeted and killed by Israel. Hundreds more have been injured, arrested, imprisoned, tortured. So this is a specific target to silence Palestinian journalists because they don't allow international media inside of Gaza. And so the loose piece for them is the Palestinian journalists themselves. And so they have particularly targeted them. They've attacked and seized Palestinian media facilities across Palestine. They've barred foreign journalists. They barred Al Jazeera even outside of Gaza. They passed punitive legislation against the leading Israeli paper, Haaretz, for including critical perspectives on what's happening in Gaza. They have a system that goes back to the beginning of the state of strict military censorship of all media inside of Israel. And then they have this very active transnational program of Israeli propaganda and disinformation, which fabricates all sorts of lies to justify their war crimes, starting on October 7th with falsified stories of beheaded babies and mass rape campaigns in military command centers under hospitals, 
all of which has proven not to be true. And then the use of Israeli proxy organizations in the West put pressure on journalists that don't toe the line and to silence critical reporting. You've got the lockstep collaboration of many Western media corporations and openly, knowingly disseminating Israeli disinformation and propaganda, dehumanizing Palestinians, blacking out the genocide in the West. So this is a, a very key part of the genocide, both inside of Israel to maintain public support there, but also in the West, because without the support of American taxpayers, American weapons, American economic support, American diplomatic cover, American intelligence, the genocide could not continue. And that's why controlling the information is so important to them. Well, you know, for people listening who don't care much what's going on in the Middle East, listeners, you should care about what this Israeli genocide, this Israeli sub-empire, part of the U.S. empire in the Middle East, is doing to the United States and its democracy. So talk about the Congress and the gap between the White House Congress on the one hand and the American people on the other. Well, I mean, that's absolutely right. I think your, your listeners will not be surprised to know that the Congress and many in the government have reached a level of capture and corruption, much of it legalized corruption, that is probably unprecedented in the history of the organization. This is true of the pharmaceutical lobby. It's true of the insurance lobby. It's true of the real estate lobby. It's true of the military industrial complex. And it's true of the Israel lobby. And, you know, when you look now and you see the utter disconnect generally between the policies that are pursued by the Congress on the one hand and what the American people want on the other hand, you see that to call the United States a democracy anymore is kind of a cruel joke. That is certainly true when it comes to foreign policy, and it's especially true when it comes to policy around Israel and Palestine. It goes so far that you've actually got members of Congress on behalf of an oppressive foreign regime in Israel attacking American citizens, including young people in America, students on college campuses, in order to silence them from speaking up on human rights. That is truly remarkable. Not only is this oppressive foreign regime siphoning off American taxpayer money in the tens of billions of dollars to perpetrate international crime, but it is also enabling the persecution by the government, by the Congress, by university administrations of Americans who are standing up against these crimes. That tells you something about who the government is representing. Clearly, it's not the American people in such a situation. And this provision of things like 2,000 pound bomb without restriction, the purpose of this is genocide. These are quite literally weapons of mass destruction. They're being targeted on one of the most densely populated civilian areas on the planet. They're by definition indiscriminate weapons. They're guaranteed to produce mass civilian casualties. And they're directed at refugee camps, at homes, at UN shelters, at medical facilities, at all civilian areas. The United States government knows this. The United States Congress knows this. And yet it has continued to provide these weapons and to run cover for the violations of international law committed by Israel with those weapons provided by the United States. And it's done so over and over again, leaving piles of massacred bodies in their thousands. So this is, Ralph, this is legal complicity in war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. It's quintessential complicity in genocide, committed with U.S. weapons, paid for with U.S. tax dollars, supported by U.S. intelligence, facilitated by U.S. diplomatic cover, and obscured by U.S. government propaganda. There couldn't be a clearer case of complicity. You know a lot about this international criminal court. Why do the newspapers keep reporting that it's going to take months, if not years, for them to go from a plausible genocide charge and an arrest warrant for Netanyahu to a final decision on genocide. Why does it take so long? Netanyahu gives them evidence every day of the year that he's committing genocide. Yeah, I'd say a couple of things about that. One is on your point about the U.S. position. The striking thing is the hypocrisy of the U.S. 20 years ago, it was pronouncing on the world stage the importance of humanitarian intervention to stop war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Today, its principal profile on the global stage is in defense of a live stream genocide that the whole world is watching in real time. The costs to the U.S. brand over the long term are going to be massive. 
for what the U.S. is is carrying out here and for the capture of U.S. foreign policy. The American people will never get back the benefits of what they have done. The one key hope is that we are seeing cracks in the wall of impunity that Israel has enjoyed with the defense of the U.S. and the U.K. and the Germans and some others. That impunity is starting to crack, and in significant measure, it's cracking because of the activism of civil society, of movements in the U.S., across the West, and across the world, who are waking up. And the people are pulling back the curtain on Israeli apartheid, on settler colonialism, on the genocide, and on U.S. complicity in all of these crimes. And this movement of accountability for Israeli perpetrators of redress for Palestinian victims, or boycott, divestment, and sanctions for an end to apartheid, and for account judicial accountability and international judicial mechanisms, that's growing. It's growing with the, the raising of voices by Jews and Christians and Muslims and students and workers and clergy and teachers and ordinary people from every walk of life who are standing up despite unprecedented repression, the threat of beatings and arrest by police, of expulsion from their colleges, firing from their jobs, being smeared and slandered as supporters of terrorism or anti-Semites. That's growing every day. And now it's very much unstoppable. And it's making a difference because we know from the many revelations that the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, behind the scenes, in the shadows, they have been subjected to enormous pressure by Israeli intelligence agencies, by the Mossad, that have threatened and sought to induce the judges and the prosecutors of these mechanisms going get back for a decade since the opening of the Palestine file. We know that that harassment has continued since the beginning of the genocide, the current wave of genocide in Gaza. And in spite of that, we have seen that the International Court of Justice has stepped up that Israel is on trial for genocide in the International Court of Justice. The International Court of Justice has issued its landmark opinion on the illegality of the Israeli occupation, on Israel's practicing of the crime of apartheid. And, of course, the International Criminal Court now issuing arrest warrants for Israel's leaders for crimes against humanity. And by the way, both of those actions in the International Court of Justice, and especially in the International Criminal Court, were delayed for an unprecedented amount of time because of fear and trepidation on the part of court officials, not just from the threats behind the scenes by Israel, but the public threats as well from lawless American lawmakers in the Congress threatening to obstruct justice by using the power of the United States to interfere with these trials. And yet they stepped forward because they heard from civil society, they heard from these movements, they heard from ordinary people who are not fooled by the lies of corporate media and government podiums, who are seeing with their own eyes the horrors that are being perpetrated on the people of Palestine by Israel and by the United States, the UK, and Germany. And they are standing up to oppose this. And those courts know that they too are on trial and that they may not survive if they fail to end such an obvious case of genocide and that the reputations of the individual judges and prosecutors would not survive either. And so the world has compelled these institutions to act. And that's something I think that provides a glimmer of hope in what has been an extremely dark year. Well, just as you think there's there got to be a self-restraint on the part of the U.S. government from toadying up to Netanyahu, they break through. The recent actions by the International Criminal Court and the World Court against the Netanyahu regime for war crimes, every time they put out a statement on this, Netanyahu attacks the court as anti-Semitic. How dare you challenge an Israeli leader compared to the challenges they've made to African leaders, dictators? And then, like ping pong, the next day or a few hours later, B.B. Biden and B.B. Blinken are attacking the same courts harshly, saying how dare they even try to impose and enforce international law on the Netanyahu genocidal regime. It's like a ping pong. So what do you see the future of civic resistance and civic power in the U.S. in the coming days? You think it's going to get more intense? Or do you think Trump is going to wield the terror word and use the Insurrection Act and other acts to come down even harder on people who are engaged in peaceful marches, resistance, and lobbying against 
the U.S. complicity and co-belligerency under international law with Netanyahu's genocide? Well, I don't think the, the genie of U.S. resistance in the U.S. is going away. I think all the people who are horrified by what the U.S. is doing, together with Israel in the Middle East, that has caused an awakening in this country, which is not going to go away out of fear for the Trump administration. I think that we have seen that those voices have continued to grow, those demonstrations have continued to grow, and I think they will continue to do so. That does not mean that there isn't a real danger emanating from the Trump administration. He has, as I said, put together not just an Israel first administration, but an administration of Israel extremists. You know, Marco Rubio, chief neocon, anti-Palestinian racist, Mideast war, uh, war hawk. Mike Waltz, a Zionist extremist uh, known for his advocacy of attacks on Americans at home for criticizing Israel, not to mention supporting attacks on, on the Palestinians and others on behalf of Israel. Elise Stefanik, as UN ambassador, her claim to fame is attacking American college students on behalf of the Israel lobby and demanding an end to free speech and academic freedom in order to silence public criticism of Israeli genocide and apartheid. Craig, worst, she goes and addresses the Israeli Knesset and refuses numerous requests to have a town meeting back in her own district in upstate New York. And Huckabee, who's a proposed ambassador to Israel for Donald Trump, says there's no such thing as the Palestinian people. I mean, that's the, the, ultimate, the ultimate devolution of genocide is omnicide. And that's who Trump is basically nominating. People want to wipe out the Palestinians and annex the West Bank and Gaza to the greater vision of Israel, which, going back to its founders, David Ben-Gurion, has always been the dream to take all of the Palestinian mandate and push the Palestinians out if they don't exterminate them in the meantime which Mike Huckabee would be very happy for. I mean, he's a Christian Zionist religious extremist who openly rejects international law, repeatedly makes public racist statements against Palestinians. He'll be the ambassador to Israel, and alongside him, Steve Whitcoff as the Middle East envoy, a billionaire real estate developer, an Israel lobby operative who since October 7th has been supporting the genocide and actively served as the Trump campaign's back channel to the U.S. Zionist donor community securing large six- and seven-figure donations from wealthy pro-Israel donors. You can expect that there's going to be a payback coming from that direction. And, you know, straight across the administration, Elon Musk, who used to be Mr. Free Speech, but has declared that he's free speech except for Palestine and now is the chief censor for the Israel lobby through his social media platform. So I expect that the attacks are going to continue. In some areas, they may get worse, but I don't think people are going to be deterred from speaking up in the great moral cause of our age, which is a U.S.-supported genocide in Palestine. Well, Craig, there's a nightmare scenario here. In the past year, both the CIA, NSA, and Department of Justice have been doing internal scenarios of what they call blowback. That means counterattack into this country for what we're doing to the Palestinians and others, civilians overseas. If there are counterattacks, like different versions of 9-11, or different uses of easily constructed deadly drones that have been refined and developed by Ukraine and U.S. military, it's now cheap. It's now something that can be even produced in garages with deadly arms. If that happens, that will fall right into the hands of Donald J. Trump's dictator scenario, because then he's got the terror issue to deploy. And then it's pretty much curtains for any kind of free speech and mobilization, because they'll all be called terrorists or accomplices of terrorists. Listeners, this is where it's likely to head, because you can't keep wiping out entire extended families. What do you anticipate here? This could be extremely serious and destroy all domestic priorities. You think there's going to be opportunities to expand the response to pandemics that are coming or to climate disruption that are needed or to alleviate the poverty in this country or to build up the public services in this country or to deal with mundane issues like massive solar erosion and health care denial? Your views. Well, I think that the sad reality is that successive administrations, Democrat and Republican, 
have been building the foundations for what you have just described going back for decades, and that we have been on a downward spiral in the United States in human rights terms, not just in the conduct of the United States abroad, but in the precarious positioning of the human rights of people inside the United States. And we've been horrified over the course of the last 14 months by the open assaults on the human rights of people who are standing up peacefully to oppose the genocide, not just the smears and the slander, but they have been attacked using the force of government and using the law. They have been arrested, they have been expelled, they have been fired, they have been you know, subjected to all kinds of legal harassment, including by the US uh, Congress itself and then in local administrations. The FBI, according to reports, is already knocking on the doors of people simply for speaking out against the genocide in Palestine. So I don't doubt that that dissent is going to continue until the people of the United States take back their government, which has been captured by destructive special interests, both in its domestic policy and in its foreign policy. And in foreign policy, there's no case more obvious than the capture of policy by the Israel lobby and by the military industrial complex. This is a downward spiral that wasn't born with the election of Donald Trump, is what I'm saying here. But Donald Trump is just the man for the job to fully exploit the platform that's been built for him by Biden and Obama and Bush and others going back for decades with the erosion of the human rights of all of us. And I think if the American people don't wake up very soon, that the dark scenario that you draw will happen either in the next administration or in an administration to come afterwards. I also think that you are right in your premise that you cannot actively participate in the sniper hunting of children, in the murder of babies, in the wiping out of whole families, in the bombing of hospitals and refugee camps, in the torture of thousands, in the destruction of a whole people, and not suffer some consequence. No one is impervious to consequences for crimes of a massive historic nature of what we're witnessing happening in Palestine. We're in an extremely perilous time. Nothing since the Civil War can compare with what's going to happen. And the Democrat Party deserves a very severe denunciation for allowing it to happen and being unable and unwilling to adopt progressive policies like those espoused by Bernie Sanders, in order to defeat the worst, most vicious, the most indentured, corrupt Republican Party in history since it was formed in 1854. So the the countervailing forces are just not there. They're not there to stop it. Listeners, I don't want you to despair here. You've got one leverage left, and that's the Congress. It's very close between Democrat and Republican. But there are 535 people that are equipped with the constitutional authority to stop a lot of this. And when they see what's going to happen to their own country, to their own districts back home economically, climate disruption, all kinds of chaos, a lot of these Republicans might have second thoughts and stand up for the Republic and the Constitution. Your final thoughts, Craig, anything you want to say before we have to conclude? Well, I hope that you are right about some hope within the United States Congress or the Democratic Party. I have some skepticism on that. I suspect that on the matters we've been discussing, both are equally captured, and that's the danger that we we find ourselves in. My hope, the light that I look to, is in the people themselves, in civil society, in movements, and in this flame that's been growing to oppose these kinds of horrors just among ordinary people, the students who have led in this country the moral vision that has been lacking for for so long over the course of the last year plus, labor unions, social movements, peace movements, human rights defenders, people who work in the public interest. Unfortunately, the institutions themselves, in my view, which includes the Congress, which includes the administration, which includes the political parties and others, I think these are lost us in large measure. And I think as much as we'd like to turn to them, and we have to use whatever we have, I agree with you there, but as much as we'd like to turn to them for hope, we're at a moment in history where we have to make our own hope, where it's up to us. And it's not going to be easy, but either we push back, either we resist what has been happening and what is coming, or I'm going to have to agree with the dark that you set up. 
There's more precedent for optimism here. When the American people made their stand on the Vietnam War unrebuttable, the Congress cut off the appropriations during the Nixon years and stopped the Vietnam War. They just cut off the money. And years later, when Obama was thinking of sending the U.S. military into Syria, 95% of a torrent of no, no, no poured into the Congress on Republican Democratic incumbents. And the Congress froze any attempt by Obama to go into Syria. So don't underestimate the power of the sudden arousal of indignant Americans who see that they're all living in the same boat in this country and that divide and rule tactics of the ruling classes are no longer going to divide and rule and that they have their families and their neighborhood and their communities and their future to protect. And it's going to be done by taking control of Congress between elections. They don't have to wait for elections because members of Congress have their finger to the wind every day of the year, and the people have got to give them powerful wind power from back home. Steve? I wanted to get back to the International Criminal Court, and what, what is the likelihood that Netanyahu and his minions will actually be arrested, or is this largely symbolic? It is at the moment unlikely that they will be arrested, but it's not symbolic. And the reason is because it has already had an impact on Netanyahu and Gallant's lives. They cannot travel to at least 124 countries with confidence. They cannot pursue their personal interest or their, or their governmental interest or otherwise because those states are obliged to arrest them and to hand them over to the court. Now, there, it's true that the U.S. has been working behind the scenes to peel off some of those Western states that have subsequently France and others issued equivocal statements on whether or not they would meet their obligations under the Rome statute to arrest Netanyahu. But in the end, I believe that it will, the statute will prevail. And that means not only in those 124 countries, but in other countries as well, where states have obligations under other treaties, not least the Genocide Convention, who are bound by the provisional measures of the International Court of Justice, they too may feel compelled to cooperate with the court. So it is unlikely that Israel will hand over its perpetrators for international trial, but they are already extremely limited. They have been marked as fugitives from justice, as suspected perpetrators of crimes against humanity. That impact is real, and it is a part of chipping away at that longstanding impunity of Israel, and therefore it's extremely important. So they may never be, be brought to trial, but they will pay a cost for these enormous crimes. David? America and Israel are not signatories to the Rome Agreement. So can you be arrested by the International Criminal Court if you're from a country that doesn't recognize the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court? It can be because the statute of the International Criminal Court provides also for territorial jurisdiction. It only requires that one interested party be a party. In this case, Palestine is a recognized party to the Rome Statute. The crimes are being committed on the territory of Palestine. So Netanyahu is covered there. Those in the U.S. who are actually violating the Rome Statute through obstruction of justice and attacking the court officials also may have some concerns, even though the U.S. has not ratified it. Because the Netherlands, which is the seat of the International Criminal Court, is a party to the Rome Statute. And so crimes committed on the court would be covered by the jurisdiction of the territorial jurisdiction of the Netherlands. And the statute of the court itself makes criminal these kinds of attacks that some people in Washington have been launching against the court. So, of course, you know the U.S. has committed itself to obstructing justice and to attacking the court that the Congress has actually passed the so-called Hague Invasion Act in order to have some legislative justification for attacking the Netherlands in order to free any perpetrators from the International Criminal Court. We are well and true witnessing a government of the United States, which is a rogue state on the international scene with real disdain for international law. But it's clear that the jurisdiction would be there and that the court could take action if it had the courage to do so. Hannah? What if we say this is America's final form? We have a lot of fixing to do at home, but the rest of the world is getting us 
kind of full throttle. This is who we've always wanted to be, threatening to invade the Netherlands to free war criminals from The Hague. So let's say the rest of the world finally decides that America cannot be reasoned with. Is there a way for other UN member states or signatories to certain conventions or just other countries who can forge alliances to remove the U.S. from the equation in a plausible way, or if not plausible, high in the sky, we're creating a, you know, fantastical imaginary scenario that is possible, if not plausible. Well, that that is the way that much of the world already views the United States. And I can tell you as someone who lived and worked internationally for 32 years, long before even this genocide in Palestine, the view of much of the world if not most of the world, that the U.S. was effectively a rogue actor that placed itself above international law, above basic humanity, and would use its force, the power of its dollar and the power of its military, to impose its will, no matter how cruel or unjust, on the rest of the world. That was already the view. Now, after the course of the last 14 months, you know, the, the few remaining skeptics around the world have seen that the curtain has been pulled back so radically and I've seen the U.S. for what I'm afraid to say is the reality of the U.S. empire and the way that it behaves. That has contributed, I think, to the decline of the unipolar moment, the decline of what you could call U.S. empire that was already beginning to decline with the rise of China and others, the re rise of other alliances like the BRICS, the diminishment of the U.S. position in the United Nations outside of the Security Council, where it has a veto, the U.S. has lost a lot of power and influence in other bodies, in the Human Rights Council, in the General Assembly, and elsewhere. It is extremely isolated on the international stage. Just yesterday, it voted with Israel and a few South Pacific dependencies and a few far-right regimes, almost alone against the entire world on the latest resolution on Palestine and on the occupation and on an international conference to be convened next year. So the U.S. is increasingly isolated. Its star is declining. Its stock is declining on the international stage as others raise. And any moral capital that it ever had that wasn't already spent before October of last year has now been completely exhausted. So, you know, in our life, we're going to see a lot more struggle and upheaval and violence and suffering. But we are clearly, in my view, witnessing the decline of the American empire through self-inflicted wounds, to be sure. All empires eventually devour themselves, and we're not going to be an exception unless we arouse ourselves to reverse the tide of historical judgment. Craig, before we conclude, what would you like our listeners to read that you've written? And is there anything else you'd like to say? Well, I've been dedicating myself very much to this genocide over the course of the last year, publishing on Mondo Weiss in particular a series of pieces that are designed to undo the propaganda that has saturated the West about claims, for example, of Israel having a right to defend itself, claims about human shields, a whole range of issues that are deeply distorted in the public discourse in the U.S. and in the, in the broader West. I feel folks should take a look at Mondo Weiss for, for those pieces. Thank you. We've been talking with Craig McIver for many years, was working for various UN agencies on human rights all over the world. He knows what he's talking about. He's observed and thought about these issues for a long time. And thank you for your contributions on the program today, Craig Mokhyber. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, guys. We've been speaking with Craig Mokhyber. We will link to his work at Mondo Weiss at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Up next, we'll hear Ralph's thoughts on Trump's cabinet, credit card fees, and conflicts of interest at the AARP. But first, let's check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Friday, December 6, 2024. I'm Russell Mokhyber. Leading military contractors jacked up the price of several everyday products after receiving non-competitive contracts costing taxpayers more than $1.3 million in apparently unnecessary markups. That's according to a report from Responsible Statecraft. Until 2010, Boeing charged an average of $300 for a trash container 
container used in the E-3 Sentry, a surveillance and radar plane based on the 707 civilian airliner. When the 707 fell out of use in the United States, the trash can was no longer a commercial item, meaning that Boeing was not obligated to keep its price at previous levels. In 2020, the Pentagon paid Boeing over $200,000 for four trash cans, translating to roughly $52,000 per trash can. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokaira. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with David Feldman, Hannah, and Ralph. So, Ralph, as we get to the end of the program today, you've got a few things you want to bring up. What do you have on your mind? Well, there are a number of things, actually, Steve. We're pleased to hear that one of our recent guests to be interviewed, Dr. Marty McCary of the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore, has been nominated by Donald Trump to head the Food and Drug Administration, one of the few sterling nominations in an otherwise very desolate and crony field of nominees. So that's a good sign. The FDA is going to get someone who really knows what's going on in the food industry and focusing on prevention and chronic diseases, as well as other missions of the FDA. The second thing is that there is an article in Tuesday's New York Times that really caught my attention. This is December 3 in the New York Times, and it says, quote, as cash era ends, retailers pray for limits on swipe fees. So I'm saying as cash era ends, we don't want the cash check system of payments ever to end. That's the definition of freedom. That's the definition of protecting your privacy. That's the definition of bargaining power when you have complaints against the sellers. Anyway, looking down in this article, it says that debit and credit card fees are among the top monthly expenses for many small businesses, which say the costs are becoming more onerous as fewer customers carry cash. Merchants of all sizes paid a total of, get this, $172 billion, with a B, in dollars in processing fees in 2023. When these businesses swipe a credit card, businesses pay fees to the bank that issues the card to the payment network and often to companies like Toast and Square and on and on. So we've got a great ally here for those who want to continue not to be undermined and refused to purchase because they're offering a cash or a check. And of course, you know, have millions of unbanked poor people who don't have a credit card or a debit card account. And they need to be protected. And to have a small business be a lobby is quite formidable. There was a hearing on this in Congress recently where both Republicans and Democrats were on the same side objecting to these huge swipe fees. So, Ralph, you think that a small business lobby could form as leverage against these financial institutions that are raising these fees? Yeah, most definitely. And they can also introduce something that's good for consumers. They can put a sign in the window on Main Street USA and offer cash discount. In other words, anybody who pays in cash or check where the small business gets 100% of the amount will receive a discount. And Ralph, you wrote a letter having to do with AARP. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yes. We want to talk about this more later, but on October 14th, I sent a letter to Joanne Jenkins, the CEO of AARP in Washington, D.C., basically raising the issue that as a nonprofit, they've become commercially entangled with the insurance companies who they have delegated their customers to be served by. United Healthcare is a big one on Medigap, for example. And I outline a number of areas where ARP is not standing for the consumer. They have been conflicted because they get royalty fees and they get all kinds of revenue from the insurance companies, health insurance companies, auto insurance companies. They're in business, and this puts them in a conflict of interest situation. Now, they put out a publication that's very useful to people. They talk about scams and how to avoid them. They have chapters all over the country where elderly people get together on public issues. But this side of them, the commercial side, has to be explored. And the letter asked right off to disclose the full text of all the contracts they have with these insurance companies and other commercial consultants. Well, haven't gotten an answer. 
So we want our listeners to read the letter. It will be on our website. And if you're a member of a chapter of AARP, you know, discuss the letter and see if you had experiences like that. And let's make AARP more of a consumer advocate and less of a business proposition. So it's about sort of mobilizing actual consumers to put the pressure on AARP that hopefully will put the pressure on, you know, their Congress members. Is that the strategy? Yes, because once they contract out, the fine print kicks in by the Hartford Auto Insurance Company, United Healthcare, and people are not given proper treatment when it comes to benefits, when it comes to reasonable pricing, when it comes just to answering complaints on the telephone where you're you're lucky to get through to a human being in 10 or 15 minutes and then even luckier to get an answer to your question. So they have it all gamed out. They're very clever. They work at it full time to maximize their profits and maximize their executive bonuses. So we'll talk about this more in later programs, listeners, but it's good for you to read this two-page letter as a prelude to joining the effort here. AARP has maybe 18 million members. That's a big, big organization, and we want it on our side. We want it on the side of single-payer, universal insurance, full Medicare for all. All right, very good. I want to thank our guest again, Craig Mokhyber. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up, featuring Francesco DeSantis with In Case You Haven't Heard. A transcript of this program will appear on the Ralph Native Radio Hour Substack site soon after the episode is posted. Subscribe to us on our Ralph Nader Radio Hour YouTube channel. And for Ralph's weekly column, it's free. Go to Nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to CorporateCrimereporter.com. The American Museum of Tort Law has gone virtual. Go to TortMuseum.org to explore the exhibits, take a virtual tour, and learn about iconic tort cases from history. To order your copy of the Capitol Hill Citizen, Democracy Dies in Broad Daylight, go to CapitolHillCitizen.com. And remember to continue the conversation after each show. Go to the comments section at RalphNaderRadioHour.com and post a comment or question on this week's episode. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt, Hannah Feldman, and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Our proofreader is Elizabeth Solomon. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everybody. And join the Capitol Hill Citizen. Become a Capitol Hill Citizen. It's an empowering publication. There's nothing like it in America. And it focuses on the one institution that we can take control of to turn around our country, the U.S. Congress. Stand up, stand up, stand up. You are to stand.